the compliments, no matter what their intentions were, they felt like an insult. And that is uniquely British behavior. It is uh, customary, isn't it, at this stage to leave the gentleman alone? Oh, you mean you'd like a hand with the washing up? I'm going to try to tell you what mind is about. It appears to be this guy who is the bodyguard of an East End, not quite gangster, but a real shady cat. When I first sat down to watch it, I thought, okay, I ain't been in the country long. I learned something about British culture watching this. There's this thing called um, Cockney slang, which is real peculiar to me. Even now, I've been here nine years and it's still peculiar to me. Just, you know, where's Joe? He went up the apple and pears. What? Apple and pear? Stairs. Why can't you just say fucking stairs? He stuffs an individual fruit pie into his north and south. That's not on, is it? One of the things that was frustrating about Minder for me was I kept thinking of, you know, Terry dealing with Arthur, and I just kept thinking, well, just tell him no and walk off. Me? Sleeping there? Leave it out. Just say no and just walk away, and he would never do that. You must be the good Samaritan who's volunteered to keep a watchful eye on this chap. Um, well, no, actually. No, it's, uh, it's me. Mondo was quite, quite a little dude. I mean, he wasn't no big cat, you know. When he deals with rough guys, he could just grab somebody by the lapels and throw them up against the wall and go, tell me what I want to know, and they go, okay, okay, okay. And I'm like, but Mondo's smaller than him. Rumpel and Mondo, Mondo and Rumpel, two lovable, possibly just likable losers. <laughs> God, there's just too many channels these days. There's even a channel aimed at people who've just banged their knee on the coffee table. Oh, nothing. The biggest problem facing channels today is standing out in the crowd. And the easiest way to do that is to adopt a human face, making that key talent the face of the channel. The face of the channel is usually signed under an exclusive contract and used to front not just signature shows, but also to appear in promotions for the station and one-off specials. It seems to work. It's hard to think of BBC One without picturing debonair urban schoolboy Jonathan Ross fronting one of his many vehicles. While ITV is so reliant on lovable elf in scamps Ant and Deck, if they needed someone to announce the outbreak of nuclear war, the chances are it would be these two. Channel 4, meanwhile, has so many faces of the channel, it needs a bloody machine just to house them all. Just about the only channel without a face is BBC Two. Well, I suppose they got the two. Of course, the trouble with investing so much in one face is what happens when that face loses face. Case in point, until recently, Living TV defined itself using Jade Goody. Now the only channel she'll be fronting is the Pariah Network. Sadly, I'm too niche, too embittered and too piss-pot ugly to make it as the face of a channel. But I am the new face of shit chisel dog food. So it's not all bad. Uh, one time I was uh, working as a researcher on a cooking show and uh, one of the celebrity chefs, no names mentioned, uh, had a real reputation for being a slimy bastard um, and was constantly flirting with all the production team. This one time, I remember after one of the shows, uh, me and a runner were clearing up and uh, just chatting away and stuff and he came up behind us with a baguette in between his legs and started waving it around and then he started wanking the baguette. Then he picked up a carrot and started giving it a blowjob right in front of us. We stood there watching him for a minute and then just carried on clearing up and chatting. And uh, after a while, he just put the baguette and the carrot down and just left silently. I mean, what a cock. Vernon Kay was born 28th of April 1974 in Bolton. Kay left school with 11 GCSEs and worked cleaning phone boxes so he could afford to go clubbing in Manchester. Little changed until 1997 when rain forced Kay to take shelter at a clothes show live event where he is spotted by model scouts. Shortly after, Kay wins the Big Breakfast Model of the Week competition catching the eye of execs from Channel 5. 1999, Kay is presenter for the BBC where he meets wife Tess Daly at a Christmas party. On their first proper date, Kay has the sea bass. Kay joins T4 later in 2000 and by 2002 the model turn presenter is hosting the Smash Hits Poll Winners Party. Kay's triumphs continue in 2003 when he weds fiancé Tess Daly. 2004 presenting credits include the Prince's Trust Urban Music Festival, a tribute to Jay-Z, and a wife for William. 
In a bizarre incident during summer 2005, one of Kay's live broadcasts for T4 was interrupted when three monsters burst into the studio and pissed on him. Today, Kay continues to work as a TV presenter and has recently finished hosting the first series of All-Star Family Fortunes. Well done, Vern and Kay. Courtroom dramas have long been a telly favourite. For 13 years, Crown Court was a TV staple and somewhat ahead of its time in that it featured fictional cases whose outcome was decided by a jury drawn from genuine members of the actual public who lived in authentic houses in Reality Street. Now it's back as The Verdict, an unusually serious reality show in which a jury assembled from the famous and infamous presided over a garish but thankfully fictional rape trial which took place in a real courtroom with real barristers and a real judge played by Donald Trump. Amongst those sitting in judgment were Easter Island figurine Michael Portillo, former Blur man Alex James, and a seven-year-old boy who'd wandered in by mistake. Then there was Ingrid Tarrant, Honor Blackman, and from ITV's Fortune, Jacqueline Gold and Jeffrey Archer continuing his nationwide rehabilitation tour. Glamour was provided by human Orville impersonator Jennifer Ellison. Together with Bianca, she spent most of the case eating, joking, and doing some nice colouring in. Thanks to the nature of the case, much of the action consisted of watching famous faces listening stony face to graphic descriptions of sexual acts, which made for downright eerie viewing. He intentionally penetrated with his penis the anus of Anna Crane. When they show somebody famous and they start talking about bottoms and penises and things, you can't help picturing their bottoms and their bits. Things got worse when they retired to the recess room to discuss the finer points of the case. When a man comes, how quickly does a man perform a game? Well, I don't know. Didn't you find that out in prison? I don't think that girl would have had... I think it's unlikely she would have had a, um, anal so, sex. I agree. At 19? Yes, I agree. Oh, Alex James is dying to chip in. I think, I I think people... Explore like that. Then you do it with somebody you know, don't yes, you? Yes, quite. And pretty, pretty slowly and pretty carefully and pretty tenderly. A bit like cellmates, you might say. Eventually, graphic sexual language was being bandied about so freely it took on a strange kind of poetry. The statements are as much the evidence as the anal tear, the pubic hair, and that girl called Claire, and the judge's chair. And the verdict, yeah. Of course, the problem at the heart of the show was that the case itself wasn't real, making it impossible to tell which of the key figures was telling the truth because at the end of the day, they were all acting. Nevertheless, it was very interesting to see how quickly the jury forgot this. Stan Collymore, for instance, appeared to have decided the outcome of the case before it even started. He refused to budge throughout, verbally bludgeoning all who dared disagree with him at every opportunity. I stick to my point and I'm consistent with it. Stan. You can't sit on a high horse Stan, and you're start... Out of order. start no, I'm not out of order at all. Actually, I'd like to propose a new word for the dictionary. Collymore arrogantly and aggressively drown out the opposing view in an argument by droning on and ruddy on in a brummy accent. A couple of the jurors were what you might describe as near the knuckle choices. Take So Solid Crew rapper Mega Man, named after a video game character and understandably furious at the whole process after spending 18 months behind bars on remand during three trials by jury before being found not guilty of murder. I don't care, that's bullshit. All right, Meg. Most controversially of all, Sarah Payne, mother of Sarah Payne, who was murdered six years ago. Throughout proceedings, she displayed a frankly awesome degree of level-headedness and, well, downright strength. But I hope that I do make educated decisions and I'm not some angry mother whose daughter's been murdered that just wants revenge for every, every you know, revenge on every man out there because that's not who I am and um, that's not why I do what I do. The decision to include the two of them may have looked sensational on paper, but in practice, I think it actually added a lot of depth to proceedings. In fact, overall, despite the obvious problem that it was all essentially make-believe, the verdict was also an absorbing, thought-provoking and ultimately nail-biting piece of television. Not guilty. Not guilty. Although maybe next time they'd like to tackle a slightly more pleasant case, like, I don't know, the case of a cartoon duckling that quacks the, the wrong... Oh, I don't know. There's loads of great stuff on next week's show, including Stuart Lee. If you were a teenager on TV in the 70s, you weren't going to be worried about trying to score some dope at a party or get off with someone from the girls' school. What you were going to be worried about was 
was a mysterious pagan cult from millions of years ago going to try and take over your mind? Or were your parents going to abandon you as society plunged into a pre-industrial dystopia?